This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And welcome, in, folks, to another edition of Open Mic Night. I'm your host, Noah Taluki. And on today's episode, the Lions losing preseason game number two, 26 to 20 against the Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll break that down for you and give my thoughts on some of the training camp practices as well. Also, Miguel Cabrera getting the big number 500 home run on Sunday in Toronto. I'll uh, break that down and give you my thoughts on Miguel Cabrera and his future with the Detroit Tigers later on in the show. We will have Dave Burkett from the Detroit Free Press, the Lions beat writer. He will be joining us to talk a little bit more about the Lions uh, and their last game and, and a little bit about Calvin Johnson and uh, his experience over there at the Hall of Fame as well. But thanks again, folks, for tuning in. It's a great, great time to be a sports fan. I mean, a lot of sports going on. And you think about it, high school football starting back up in Michigan uh, Thursday and Friday. A lot of teams getting underway week one. I know in Ohio over here in Cleveland, of course, where I am right now, uh, they started last week because in Cle- in Ohio they have 10 regular season games compared to just nine in Michigan. But I'm doing a, a couple of uh, some work with some of the high schools uh, in the area around um, John Carroll University, one of them at uh, Cleveland Heights. I'm doing uh, some broadcasting for them. That's actually the same high school that the Kelsey brothers went to. So Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey. I know uh, they they always love representing the uh, the Heights area. You know Heights High forever. You know all that kind of stuff. So it was uh, it was awesome and it was really cool actually uh, talking to uh, Travis Kelsey when I got to meet him at the Jarvis Landry softball game. Talking a little bit about you know Cleveland Heights High School and how I do games and all that for them. So it was a really really good conversation. It's a lot of fun too. It's it's a lot of fun. Plus Cleveland Heights is one of the best teams in the Cleveland area, and uh, I really, really love high school football. Nor- Northeast Ohio, one of the best areas in the entire country. I mean, th- there's so many teams here that are just loaded with talent, and a lot of Division One players in this area as well. And uh, I know in, in, in Michigan, it's a little different, in, in my opinion. You know, it's not... It's not as crazy as it is in Ohio, but it's definitely definitely a, a lot of people really, really rally around their teams in Michigan. No doubt about that. But really looking forward to it. You know, if if you uh, if if you're listening out there, you know, try a stop and buy a high school game on Friday. You know, or anything like that. Maybe uh, maybe your old high school, you know, is having a game and and you want to stop by as an alum. It's there's nothing like high school football. And you know, when I played for one year at the University of Detroit Jesuit. You know, I uh, I I just I, I still remember that feeling of running out of the tunnel of the first game and seeing the fans and seeing the student section. It just made me think, you know, all that hard work we put in the summer and now week one. I, I still remember that. I, I can really I'm picturing it right now. You never forget that that high school football feeling. So go to a game if you're an alum of a of a high school. Make sure you go out there and uh, celebrate the uh, the fact that high school football is back finally. And uh, hopefully later on in the year we'll we'll have a couple uh, guests on that, that are talking about high school football. So we shall see. All right. So I do want to break a little bit uh, down the Lions game against the Steelers. We'll dive a little bit more deeper into it with Dave Burkett later on in the show. Uh, but twenty six to twenty. The score was not as close as it seemed, folks. I mean, they scored 20 points in the fourth quarter uh, unanswered, basically. And it was, uh, you know, it was not good. You know, the series that I saw, uh, mostly I watched the up to the first three quarters. The fourth quarter it was kind of weird because I, I got the NFL Game Pass, right, and where they uh, you can stream any preseason game you want. And for whatever reason... They decided to not show much of the fourth quarter and instead go on to the next game. I think it was the Raiders and uh, whoever the Raiders were playing that day. And it was, uh, you know, I didn't get to see the the final fourth quarter, but it didn't really matter because really what mattered was the Lions' main starters against Big Ben and uh, the Roethlisberger and all that. So Ben Roethlisberger played almost the whole first quarter for Pittsburgh. And... You know, he wanted to get more time with Matt Canada, his new offensive coordinator and all that. So that's why he was out there for more series than usual. And he just sliced and diced the Lions defense. I mean, it was quite embarrassing. I mean, there were missed tackles all over the place. Just little swing passes to running backs out in the flat that the Lions were getting burned on. There was a deep ball. I believe it was to Deontay Johnson. And he was matched up against Jeff Okuda. And he just absolutely burned Okuda. Will Harris had no safety help over the top either. And the Lions continue to get burned by tight ends. I mean, the 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 
Pat Fryermuth, the rookie tight end from Penn State, he had two touchdowns in the first quarter against the Lions. So the Lions definitely had their fair share of struggles. However, on a positive note, I think some jobs were won in Pittsburgh. I think some backup jobs especially. I think Derek Barnes, he earned himself a spot on uh, on this 53-man roster. I mean, he had a, a couple of great tackles. He had a big sack as well, even though the game was well out of reach. It was really, really good to see that from him. The defensive line was getting a little bit of pressure as well up the middle. I mean, not a whole lot of sacks or anything, but they were you know, you know, know, plugging up the middle some, somewhat with Leva Anzarike and Aline McNeil. Also, I think David Blau earned himself the backup job. I don't think Tim Boyle has impressed at all in these first two preseason games. So David Blau, I think, will be the backup quarterback behind Jared Goff this season. But, you know, if, if something happens to Jared Goff, oof, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. They The Lions actually signed Jordan Tamu, uh, an old quarterback from the XFL, but they just released him just a couple days ago. So it's not much there with Tim Boyle and David Blau as backups to Goff. Of course, Goff did not play. A lot of the Lions starters did not play. TJ Hawkinson, of course, he's been out with an injury. DeAndre Swift, same sort of thing. And, you know, some of the defensive starters were out, like Jamie Collins and Trey Flowers, among others. But this was a great opportunity for some of those guys that are backups to get a chance to, you know, show up. And a couple of them didn't. And I think... Guys that have real spots in jeopardy. Jalen Reeves Mabin, I know he's a special team stud, but he did not look good at the linebacker position for the Lions on uh, against the Steelers. And same with Jelani Tavai. I mean, Tavai is one of those guys that you know had a big target on his back from from the get go because he was a second round pick, uh, for, especially with the fans. Second round pick when most scouting experts thought he was like a fourth or fifth round pick. So I, I don't I don't think those guys, at least from their performance against the Steelers, will make this team. And Dan Campbell publicly said, you know, these are there's going to be guys out there that you guys think out there in the media that will make this team that will not. So Dan Campbell being very honest and upfront about it. We'll learn more about some of those comments and, and all that later on with with Dave Burkett. But it's it was definitely sad to see. Uh, it was you know you think that the Lions would play with a little bit more fire out there. And uh, they they just didn't seem to to have it against the Steelers. Now, were was I expecting you know a win or anything? No, I'm not really concerned with wins or losses in the preseason. I just want to see growth, and there wasn't a whole lot of growth uh, on, on against the Steelers. I just really I didn't see much. You know, Sewell he continued to struggle. However, I'm not really too worried about Sewell. I know it's tough because he didn't play last year. He decided to opt out of the 2020 season at Oregon. So I think right now for Sewell, he's just shaking off the rust because he hasn't played football since 2019. So it's been almost a year and a half for him. So he, I think he's just shaking off the rust. Hopefully he'll be ready to go by week one because this offensive line, you know, they're the strongest unit of this group, uh, arguably the strongest unit of the Lions. So I think, I, I think it's just rust. But they gotta they gotta be able to go and be the leaders of this Lions team if they want to uh, make any noise or, or anything like that. But I don't know. At, at least at this point, it seems like it's just going to be a developmental year. You know, it could be you know trying to set up for a, a draft pick for for a, a really big time position player, maybe a wide receiver or a quarterback. You know, you know who knows. The draft is a long ways away. I don't want to get into the draft conversation, but not really a good performance overall for, from the Lions and some individual guys did play well yes but as a team I, I just I just wasn't inspired you know I just I was not feeling that confident uh, am I always confident about the Lions deep down of course you know I, I I'm always a believer as a fan and all that but just tonight or a couple nights ago I just was not really having it and and Dan Campbell and company you know I'm not on the I'm not on the train that says you know these guys are busts already and you know they haven't even coached a game in the National Football League, a, pr- uh, a regular season game, I'm not ready to to say this is a bust. You gotta be with this team. You gotta be in it for the long haul. You have to. You can't. And I know. In the, I know NFL teams have gone from worst to first before, but this isn't one of those situations. This is this is something that they're gonna have to learn and develop and grow uh, before we we start you know seeing seeing a whole lot of big time success with the Lions. So we'll have to see. They play the Colts on Thursday. No, on Friday. I'm sorry. It's at Ford Field. Game is 
at seven o'clock. So I'm a you know I'm gonna definitely be watching uh, Lions or Colts favored by three and a half. <laughs> you could bet on preseason football over under thirty two and a half right now uh, for that game if you're really into betting uh, for preseason. But it's uh, I'll be watching. I want to see. Hopefully, golf will play. I think this is kind of a dress rehearsal, especially because a lot of NFL teams, you know, this is their first year of the three preseason games. So. It's going to be interesting to see how each team takes this last game. Uh, you know, I'm, hopefully it'll be a dress rehearsal because usually in the past the last preseason game is literally just for the backups to play. Uh, you, that fourth preseason game. Now it's the third is the last one. I think hopefully it'll be a, a like a dress rehearsal for for the starters because they'll have a a little bit of time off before their first game uh, against the 49ers on the 13th of September at Ford Field. Speaking of Ford Field, I saw it was its 19th anniversary today on uh, Tuesday. So there was something on Facebook I saw of uh, sharing your favorite memory at Ford Field, and a lot of a lot of a lot of losses with the Lions, but I definitely have my fair share of, of, of good memories over there. I'll, I'll never forget Calvin Johnson and his uh, three touchdown performance uh, against the Eagles on Thanksgiving. I, I was there for that. I was. I'll never forget that. That was that was special. And then you know, Big Sean doing the halftime show and all, and all that. That's one of my favorite uh, Ford Field memories because they blew out the Eagles, forty-five seventeen in that. And uh, you know, the Lions usually don't blow out teams like that, so it was something to savor. And then, of course, the next week, the infamous you know Hail Mary game, the the Green Bay and, and Rodgers to Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers to Richard Rodgers. So I guess that's my favorite Ford Field memory. Just cruising through Facebook today and, and seeing the 19th anniversary of Ford Field at the corner of uh, Brush and uh, Adams, I believe is the street. All right, so I do want to move on before we get to Dave Burkett to the Detroit Tigers, Miguel Cabrera, number 500. And, you know, after he didn't get it done at home, it just, you know, I, I, I kind of if if I was like a blimp, the air kind of got out of the blimp. You know, it kind of just deflated. I was a little bit deflated since he didn't get it at home, and publicly he wanted to get it at home. I, he he said I really wanted to do it in Detroit, but everyone was kind of on Miggy watch from that that point on. You know, no home runs in that one series in the middle of the week, but then going to Toronto in the weekend, he finally got it done against Steven Matz on Sunday, and it was an opposite field home run. Miggy's specialty. He loves those opposite field home runs, and it was great uh, right center field, and nobody caught it, and it didn't go in the stands. It actually went near the Tiger bullpen in the outfield, so uh, he officially got that home run ball, and uh, really, really good to see with uh, Miguel Cabrera. And, you know, Miggy, at this point in his career, he's just all about the milestones. And 500, there's only 28 players in Major League Baseball history that have ever accomplished that. If Miguel Cabrera gets to 3,000, which he will, he's at 2,955 as we speak, not including the Cardinals game from from tonight, which he, he homered, so he's actually at 501 home runs. But, however, he would only be the seventh player to, in history to have 500-plus home runs and 3,000-plus hits. So uh, Miguel Cabrera, obviously one of the, the greatest hitters of our generation, if not the greatest, uh, the Triple Crown winner, two-time MVP. I mean, you know, but maybe he's just at the point in his career where he is just, uh, it's about the milestones. Is this a guy that can help you in the clubhouse? Of course. Are you expecting, you know, 2012, 2013 production out of him? No. But a great leader in the clubhouse, a guy that, you know, you know has a ton of experience and, and all that and is great with his teammates, just loves being around the game, as everyone knows. And uh, a guy that I really hope, and I know, you know he's got that hefty contract still, but a guy that if he can stay healthy, you know can contribute in bits and pieces. You know we we've seen it this year. I mean his his I mean obviously his average is just around two fifty, uh, which is pretty average. But you know we're not getting the three hundred Miguel Cabrera like we used to. But this is a guy that you know he can contribute in in little bits and pieces if he's healthy. And this season for the most part he's been relatively healthy. He hasn't had to miss you know months and months of of time because of injury. So really good to see from Miguel Cabrera. And, uh, you know, I really hope, especially with this young ball club, you know, a lot of guys rising up from the minor leagues, you know, hopefully Torkelson and Riley Green will be on this team next year. Those are, the, you know, the, the two first-round picks from the last couple of years. They're in Toledo right now getting their call-ups just uh, last week from A Erie. So, uh, you know, this is a guy that can really mentor these guys and really hopefully will be around 
uh, to be with these guys as the transition begins because Miggy really represents the old guard of the Tigers, in my opinion. He's the guy that represents the the Tigers of the early 2010s when they were making the playoffs every year, winning division titles, going to the World Series. And to have a guy like that around, and then on top of that, having Justin Verlander, possibly, because there's been some hints that he might be back next year, and uh, you know, having a having both veterans like that in the clubhouse would be would be excellent. However, I do want to mention this before we get to Dave Briquette that Jim Leland did mention some things with Justin Verlander and, and kind of talking about how you know you you better you better wish carefully with with Justin Verlander if you want you know obviously he would love him to have him back in Detroit. Everything I listen, everything that Jim Leland says, I want to listen to because this is a guy that you know has been around the game for a long time and has had a lot of success in, as an MLB manager and hopefully a, a Hall of Famer one day. But you know he's talked about Verlander and you know about the marriage with the Tigers and and how it'd be great to have him back. But you got to remember, guys, and you know this goes for me too. I, I as a fan, I he, he's my favorite Tiger of all time. But you know you got to remember this guy is coming off a of Tommy John surgery. And he's old. I mean, he's he's going to be 39 next year. And, you know, with Tommy John surgery, you never know how a pitcher is going to pitch. Now, with as good as Verlander is and on the Hall of Fame path that he is, you know, I cross our fingers. I hope he really rebounds from Tommy John. I mean, he said publicly he wanted to play another five years, pitch another five years. So if... You know, guys like Miguel Cabrera, hopefully Justin Verlander next year, if they can be around for this transition of the new the new era Tigers, the new age with these new young guys and help them develop and hopefully squeeze as much production out of them as we can at the end of the tail end of their careers. Hopefully they can help us and win some games and help the Tigers win and uh, hopefully uh, you know push for the playoffs in the next year or two. So it'll be interesting to see how the offseason goes. I know we, we got just over a month left in the MLB season. Uh, the Tigers obviously out of playoff contention, but a, a team that's a lot more athletic, as Jim Leland said, than before. And a really a, you know, scrappy team that A.J. Hinch is really trying to model uh, you know, as a, as a manager. So it'll be interesting, and I'm really, really looking forward to that. And now, joining us on the Open Mic Night podcast, the Lions beat writer for the Detroit Free Press, Dave Burkett. And joining us now here on the Open Mic Night podcast is Dave Burkett, the Detroit Free Press beat writer for the Detroit Lions. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, happy to join you. How you been? I've been good, absolutely. And uh, this is definitely a different look Lions team than when we last talked back in uh, late January, early February. But how has training camp been so far for this uh, new Dan Campbell regime? Oh, good. You're right. Different. Um, I mean, looks different, feels different. Uh, you know, certainly a little more lively, I guess, energetic when it comes to the head coach. Um, that was, that was, uh, it's obvious to see, I guess, when you, you, you watch his press conferences, um, you know, the, the passion and the honesty, I guess, comes through and, um, look, I don't know that it's going to have a big impact on what happens on the field this year uh, from a, a win loss standpoint. You know, I, I don't anticipate the Lions being very good. Maybe they'll surprise, but you know, I, I don't anticipate them being a, a contender. But I do think the the arrow is pointed in the right direction for the organization as a whole. Now, speaking of honesty, uh, you know, just to, something from this past week with Don Muehlbach. I mean, the eighteen year long snapper and Dan Campbell basically comes out and says, you know, it's it's that's my fault. You know, what what was the reasoning behind <laughs> all that, and did the Lions handle that right? Because it didn't seem like they did. Well, look from a football standpoint, you know, I I think it was. Um, you could probably go back and find previous regimes that wanted to get rid of Don Muehlbach and just didn't have the guts to, or, or whatever the case may be. And, and so, you know, from that standpoint, Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell, um, you know, I give them credit for doing that. Letting letting go a long time, you know, player is never easy. Uh, it, he shouldn't have been caught on his birthday. I mean, I think you know, after 17 years, he probably deserved a little bit better than that, but business in the NFL, you know, Dan wanted to get out and address it on his birthday. It actually happened the next day, but he wasn't meeting with the media. Um, you know, that next day there were, there was just a walkthrough. So there was no media availability scheduled. Certainly they could have still handled it different, had a, you know, a zoom or something with us. That's the only thing that I quibble with. Dan seemed to be beating himself up a little bit about the timing of it too. But from a football standpoint, no, I don't think there was anything wrong with the move. 
So the Steelers game on uh, last week, you know, just not a very good performance. The score, you know, looked like it was better, but they, you know, of course, yeah. the 20 points scored in, in the fourth quarter, but just a lot of miscues and, and missed assignments. It looked like, you know, is this something we're going to see throughout the, the season or is this just a little bit of, you know, the beginning of, of Dan Campbell taking over? Yeah, I mean, um, but, I mean, it, you know, can't sugarcoat it. It was a, a rotten performance in that first half. I do think you have to, you know, uh, look at it through a realistic lens, and that it was a lot of the Lions twos going against a lot of the Steelers ones. So we shouldn't expect them to uh, to win this game. I mean, they're not going to be a very good team when their ones are on the field, right? So to think they're their twos that they have the depth to compete there, that's just not going to happen. They, they do need to clean up the penalties. I think there were eight of them in that first half, six of them enforced, and it's disappointing when the offense struggles to move the ball like it did. I mean, they did not cross midfield in the first half. So there's a lot to clean up. Um, frankly, I was a little more disappointed in just, uh, you know, I guess maybe a little bit of the secondary, the back seven, I guess, uh, you know, Jeff Okuda gave up a long pass that sort of set up the, the first Steelers touchdown. They had some, some mistakes in that linebacking core, Jalen Reeves, Maven and, and Jelani Tavai. Neither one of those guys is a starter, but, um, you know, they could play, uh, we'll see if Tavai makes the team, but they could play. Um, and so it's, you know, it's that, that that was a little bit disappointing to see that effort, but I wouldn't read too much into it. It's preseason. The real stuff is going to start a couple of weeks from now. I did want to ask you about T- Tavai and uh, Jalen Reeves Maven, because those are two guys that, you know, were from the previous regimes. And, uh, you know, you know, you mentioned Tavai and his status with the team is is in question for the future. This, you know, is there a big drop off between the guys from previous regimes on this team and the guys that Dan Campbell has brought in? Well, I mean, if you really look at it, the best players were brought in under the previous regime, and as they should, you know, those should be the core of your team. But Frank Ragnar, now TJ Hawkinson, Taylor Decker, I mean, these are all guys that Bob Quinn drafted. So um, say what you will about Bob Quinn, but he certainly brought in some of the the cornerstone players of, uh, you know, for this franchise going forward. Um, uh, look, uh, you know, I, I think. There's a, I mean, it happens with every regime change, right? Is they're looking for different things in players sometimes. And so Jelani Tavai, you know, the old core wanted these big linebackers and he was playing at 260 pounds and now he's down to 240 and, you know, trying to do what he can to make this team. But it just, to me, it doesn't look like, like it's a fit. So, uh, you know, that's, that's some of the, the first year, you know, turnover that you're going to have is when you still have some of these square pegs trying to, to fit into the round hole type deal. Um, so no, no real surprise that, uh, you know, this, this Lions regime and this Lions team is sort of going through that process. Talking with Dave Burkett from the, uh, Det- the Detroit free press beat writer for the Lions. So I do want to ask you with regards to some of the starters and, you know, I know some of them are hurt, you know, Swift and, and TJ Hawkinson's going through some stuff, but you, we saw Ben Roethlisberger play a couple series for, uh, the Steelers with that new offense with Matt Canada. How come we didn't see golf at all this? You know, you'd think that maybe he would want to get some more reps with Anthony Lynn's offense and all that. How, how come we didn't see him at all in the second game? Yeah. You know, he played the first game. They, they've got in 20 couple plays. I think they were slated for about a dozen. So they got in a little more work than they anticipated. Um, you know, really, I think it's just how each team handles it. You know, that was the first third preseason game for the Steelers. The first that, that, that big Ben had played, you know, some of their starters. So, um, the Lions got the work that they felt they they needed. Uh, it sort of gets to be a risk reward at some point there, right? Where you don't want to risk the most important guys that you need for the real thing. Jared Goff, Frank Ragnow, you know, TJ Hawkinson, DeAndre Swift, some of those guys. So more important that they get them right for week one. Um, look, I don't know that, you know, playing another half in a preseason is, is going to, uh, you know, matter a ton. I'm one who just... I, I, you know, frankly, I'm for sitting starters for the most part in the preseason. You can get that work in in a more controlled environment in practice. So I have no problem with the Lions or any team that, that sits at starters. So but it's a veteran, it's experienced starters at least, right? The rookies, you know, they probably need to, to work, you know, some kinks out, get some of that rust off. But I think for most of the veterans, they, they know what they're doing by this point. Speaking of some of these rookies, you know, what have you seen at camp and in these first couple games, you know, have, who has really st- stood out to you? Are, are there guys, you know, like Sewell that need to Im- improve some more or w- what's been the status with that? Yeah, Sewell's going to be fine. I mean, um, I know some Lions fans were disappointed with his his play the other day, but look, rookie playing a new position, right tackle, right? He had never played that since high school. So I wouldn't be too worried about him. There's going to be some ups and downs this year. I think we all knew that, but he's a very talented guy and they have a really good offensive line. 
you know, as you would expect those, those big linemen up front rag now Decker um, they've played well. TJ Hawkinson to me, look, fantasy tip for anyone listening to this out there, right? Draft TJ Hawkinson. Maybe you don't need to spend that high pick on George Kittle. TJ Hawkinson is going to give you a whole lot of production. I mean, he's going to lead the lions in receptions and yards and touchdowns, all that. If he stays healthy, um, he's going to have a really big year. He's looked good. Um, of the young guys, you know, the guy that he's, he's, he's a little bit off the radar. I wouldn't expect, you know, many people to know him, but Aleem McNeil, third round draft pick out of North Carolina State. He's going to play nose tackle. So he's not going to put up huge numbers, but he's been a really effective player in practice. I mean, moving people on that, uh, you know, f- on that offensive line. So um, I, you know, he would be a young guy to watch that I think could have a big role for the Lions this fall. Speaking of the offense, uh, you know, particularly when what we saw from the starters in the first game against Buffalo, you know, a lot of short passes, not really going down the field much. I believe, uh, according to the the game book, there was only four pass plays that were considered deep, you know, by, mm-hmm. by them. So just do you think this is really going to be the Lions offense this year? Just try to establish the run and, and, you know, set up the pass or could we see a lot more play action maybe later in the season when they establish that run? If they establish that yeah, run, I guess. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, that certainly is, has been the MO of what we've seen in practice so far. And there's probably a little bit more desire there than we give them credit for to, to go downfield. Um, I think Jared Goff would like to probably as any quarterback, but you know, he's, he seems to be conservative by, by nature, at least from what we've seen so far from him. Um, you know, doesn't necessarily have the great mobility to extend plays and create some of those, those deep shots. You know, I think he averaged, career low in yards, air yards per attempt last year, you know, some of those, those next gen stats that we look at and, you know, it was up about seven yards, uh, you know, the, his, his one preseason game, seven and a half yards, according to my math. Um, but that's still near the bottom of the NFL. And so I, I just think that's what the lions are going to be. It's going to be a lot of check downs and look, it's not just Jared Goff's fault, right? I mean, you know, the lions don't have much in the receiving core right now. The guys that they have, I'm on Ross St. Brown, Khalif Raymond. I mean, these are some, you know, they're, they're smaller targets and, and they can be effective very much so. But um, I think that's how the Lions are going to move the ball this year is through some of that underneath stuff. If they're able to get a running game going, that's certainly when some of that, that down the field stuff opens up. But again, the Lions don't have a lot of receivers that are going to get open down the field either. So we'll have to see if uh, how willing Jared Goff is to to force some passes into to tight windows. You, of course, are a Hall of Fame voter, and uh, you were there witnessing all the festivities just a couple weeks ago with Calvin Johnson. And don't forget about Alex Karras either, uh, the class of 2020, a a lion that uh, really deserved to get in and who's been waiting a very long time for this. So what were the festivities like? What did you think of Calvin Johnson's speech? And uh, did you did you talk with the Karras family at all when you were down there as well? Well, so. um Karis was actually, it was, he was part of the weekend, but he was actually inducted. They have a, a sort of private ceremony this spring for the, um, all the, the deceased members that were going in as part of this sort of mega class, right from 2020 and 21. So I know one of his daughters was coming in Saturday. I actually ended up leaving Saturday. I didn't stay for the speeches, but I was there for Thursday and Friday, gold jacket ceremony and, and some other things that were going on around Canton. Um, look, honestly, my first time there, I'm a Hall of Fame voter. So I've been in the room, but my first time for an actual ceremony um, and to see Calvin, I mean, this is a guy that I covered for the vast majority of his career. Um, never too emotional of a guy, uh, just sort of, you know, like to, you know, stay back and be a wallflower. I, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen him smile as big as he have, has and, and enjoy himself being around, you know, these these great football players and maybe realizing that he was a part of it, too. I mean, he walked into there was a function uh, early Friday morning and he saw me standing against the wall and he just gave me this big animated like high five. And it was like, wow, Kelvin, you know, it just it seemed like like tell how much it meant to him in that moment, you know, and, and really watching him throughout that day. So, you know, that really gave me a greater appreciation, I think, for my responsibilities as a voter and, and you know, for what these guys, for what it means to all these guys to be, you know, considered one of the 350 best football players of all time. So um, it was a, it was a good weekend from what I saw. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't stick around for the speeches on Sunday and I didn't stick around for his party Sunday night after the speeches, but um you know, deserving, well-deserving for him and for everyone else in that class. 
hopefully one day I will we'll be getting a, a receiver like Calvin Johnson uh, one day to help out that receiving core uh, hey, in I, the future. <laughs> somebody was was joking with me about this. You know, I, I think I've been on the committee for like seven years, and Kelvin was the first first presentation I've had to make, right? And they said, you, you know, you probably it's gonna be a long time before you have a, another one to make, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe in Dominican Sue, you know, maybe Stafford at some point in time if he wins a little bit, but. They're, uh, you know, they come along few and far between like Calvin Johnson, especially for the Detroit Lions. Nobody, nobody was that big and could run that fast. Uh, not many guys in NFL history could do that. That's for sure. But Dave Burkett from the Detroit Free Press, the Lions beat writer. You can follow him on Twitter at Dave Burkett. Dave, you're the, one of the best in the business. Thanks again for doing this. We really appreciate, oh, appreciate it, man. Anytime. Enjoy the season. And thanks again to Dave Burkett bringing his Lions knowledge to the forefront on the podcast. Dave is one of the best in the business. Uh, he's one of my favorite writers for sure. Always uh, has a good eye with the Lions and, and everything that they do. And uh, he, you know, three-time Michigan sportscaster of the year, or sports writer of the year, I should say, not sportscaster. Uh, definitely a, a lot of valuable knowledge. It's really good to, to catch up with the Lions a little bit and uh, catch up with some of these writers to see what their perspective is on, on what's going on in Allen Park. But pick up TJ Hawkinson, as he said, in, in fantasy. You know, make sure at least the one line you got to pick up this year, and uh, maybe we'll get to a little bit of fantasy football in the next couple weeks. But one line. Hopefully, will be uh, T.J. Hawkinson ma- making some plays and hopefully making a Pro Bowl. That's for sure. Check out all the other content on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc and Jock always do a great job. The Wrestling Podcast, Michigan Football. You know, a lot, you know they're they're going to be starting. Geez, pretty soon against Washington. Then, uh, you know, the the, the Pistons podcast, as I, I like to call it, with the, the fan report. They love talking about the Pistons, and you know they'll be starting. You know, this end in summer league. They'll be starting their preseason before we know it. And uh, of course, check out all the other content with Adam the Jock Strozinski and and, and John Macaroon, and uh, all the wonderful work that he does with Sports Illustrated. But until next week, thanks again for tuning in to Open Mic Night.